Uh, welcome once again. Uh, before starting, I would like to do an advertisement. So for the next year, we will have uh, six special postdoc positions at IMPA. Two of them will be focused more in analysis and PD. So if you know somebody that is interested to enjoy Rio de Janeiro and besides uh, IMPA, could you please tell them that to apply them for the next year? Hmm? Well, the salary, as a special salary, is about uh, four thousand per month, the twelve month. Okay, dollars, of course. Okay, so it's a great pleasure to introduce uh, our first speaker this afternoon. Is a great friend of mine for the last twenty-five years or so. Uh, Professor Gustavo Ponce from the University of California, Santa Barbara, and he will be talking about uh, unique continuation for Schrodinger evolution, evolutions and applications. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Felipe, and thank you, Hermano Frey, for the invitation. It's a pleasure to enjoy the winter here. Okay, we will be talking about unique continuation about Schrodinger Evolution Equation, and this is a joint work with Luis Escariaza, Carlos Kenny, and Luis Vega. We have been working for a few years on that subject, and if you follow some of the talk this morning, you will see that there is a plenty of work trying to see what is the minimal regularity that you can ask on the data such that the initial value problem or the boundary value problem is well posed, local. The question now that we are trying to concentrate to see what is the maximum decay that you can have in a space on the solution. Of course, that kind of question doesn't make sense for hyperbolic equation, because you have finite propagation speed. Then we will be talking about dispersive equation. And this kind of question of what is the maximum decay, you will see that it changes a lot from one equation to another. If you go to the talk of Herman Fonseca, you will see that have some to do with polynomial decay and with the result of Yorio, you ask the same question for the Kamasa hole, you have another different answer that depends on what is the traveling ways solution. If you go to the KDV, it will depend on what is the fundamental solution, the form of the fundamental solution. And in the case of the Schrodinger equation, you will see that depends on something that has to do with harmonic analysis. Let's see if I know how to use this. Then the question is this, what is the strongest possible decay in a space that a solution of the semilinear Schrodinger equation can have. Of course, the question is not very precise because it's, I'm asking, I'm not saying that it's local in time or it's global in time and so forth, right? Then since we don't know how to answer that question, we go to another question, right? And you ask, what is the strongest possible decay that a solution of this linear problem can have. Then you reduce to a linear problem. And since you want to reduce everything to something that you can answer, then you go to the linear one. Of course, the potential in this case will be in a reasonable case. We will go back there. And let's say you ask a question that you can give a complete read answer. What is the strongest possible decay that a solution of the free Schrodinger equation may have? Okay, then this question, as you will see, has to do a lot with harmonic analysis because you have the following formula. If this is the solution of the linear problem, you can write that using Fourier transform this way or convolution this way. You developed this square and you can write it this way and this stay outside and this is the Fourier transform evaluated at that point of this. Then if you pass what you have is the solution multiplied by this exponential, complex exponential, is at the time xt is exactly the Fourier transform of the data multiplied by this exponential. Then what you are asking is how fast a function and the Fourier transform can decay. Your problem is an uncertainty principle. Right? It's a completely different question if you ask you know, the question. In particular, for example, to in this morning, there was Didier, 
uh, propose, uh, say what you have in persistent property. You want to know if you have a data that belongs to a, one class, you want to know if you stay in that class. You will see that once that you have this formula, it's a balance. You cannot start with something that decay a lot and immediately decay a lot. For example, if you have a data that have compact support, you will never have exponential decay again. It's in the opposite direction, completely opposite. Okay, let's see what is exactly the type of result that you have, that you, that you are going to expect. Then since we are talking about the function and the Fourier transform except for the exponential, the question is how fast a function and the Fourier transform can decay? Well, you have infinitely many uncertainty in principle starting with Heisenberg, right? The one that we want to point out, let's start with Hardy. Hardy say the following. In one dimension that was that here stay, if you have a function that decay Gaussian in this way, and the Fourier transform decay Gaussian that way, and you have this inequality, that means that this alpha is very small multiplied by this beta, then you have to be zero. And if you have the equality, you can only be exactly that. Okay? There is infinitely many extension of that. Let me point that this was extended to, to, the, uh, to the higher dimension by Citaran, Sundai, and Tangevali, Tangabelu. And in the L2 case, was extended also by these three authors. And they have exactly the same result, even with the, the equality in this case gives you zero. If you have a, a function that with this way is in L2, and the Fourier transform with this way is in L2, and this beta and alpha multiply each other, that, you have to see. Then, let me give you another result of this kind that almost implies this one, almost. Hormander and Berlin prove the following. If you have a function in L1, and you take, in one dimension, the Fourier transform and multiply by the function and against this way, and if this is finite, is because your function is zero. If you apply x multiplied by c is less than x squared plus c squared divided by two, then you recover the Hardy inequality. Right. This was extended in two dimension by Alim Bonami, De Manger, and Jamin, and you require that this is in L2, and you have the same result. Then now you can rephrase everything in terms of the, full, in terms of the solution of the linear Schrodinger equation. And you have this result. Right? This is the Hardy. You write this in terms of the linear Schrodinger equation and say, if the data is Gaussian with this weight, and the solution is in L2 with this weight, and you satisfy this inequality, you are zero. The only thing that you are doing is rephrasing the first inequality that relate the, Fourier, the function with the solution across the Fourier transform. Okay? Then you can rephrase, you can have other certain principles. Then what is exactly that we want? We would like to have a, then we know that in the linear case, this is the best that we can do. Right? This is a, I mean, completely sharp. Then, this is a theorem that we proved more than a year ago. It says the following. Suppose that now you, are, you have a potential. And potential is complex value and bounded. And satisfy this condition. That have some decay in some sense. Then if you satisfy what we have before, and you have the strict inequality, you have to be zero. Now you are out of the Fourier transform. You don't have constant coefficient, right? And if you go back to the proof of any of these uncertainty principles, you use analytic function, and you use primarily the law of maximum principle, and this is that you are out. There is no regularity whatsoever here in B. In fact, there is no condition on the side in B. Then you, if you go to this theorem, you will see, well, there is a... You, will, you can ask, is this the largest possible class where this is true, this kind of question, right? But there is no, I remark again, there is no condition on the regularity on B on the side of B besides that this is satisfied, right? Then you can ask, well, but you are losing the equality here. 
Well, you cannot do the equality. You have, we construct a potential, at the point of x and t, where the solution is not zero and satisfy this condition. Therefore, you extend, in some sense, Hardy result to Schrodinger equation with potentials, right? In some class. Is that the best class? Well, that's a question, right? Then you can go now to your favorite uncertain principle and ask the same question, right? Translate this into the Schrodinger equation and put a potential there to see if you can do that, right? Okay, we have done that in different uncertainty principles, in particular the one that I state, the Berlin Hormander, but this is not part of our business today, right? Okay. Then, now we can say something about the nonlinear problem, and the nonlinear, if we, now if we have a solution of this nonlinear equation, that you have some regularity that I doubt that is sharp, and you have a solution that has some regularity, and these two solution, these two solution, satisfy that with the difference with this weight is in L2, they have to be equal. In no moment, you are assuming that this solution agree. You just are saying that they have to separate according to a certain principle for the linear case. A question is, if you choose one of these solutions to be zero, that is a particular solution of that, then you have that a solution of this equation has, cannot decay Gaussian at two different times with this constant satisfying this condition. But that doesn't answer the question that I posed at the beginning. We don't know any solution of the Schrodinger equation that decay Gaussian, to be completely honest. This is, a, okay, this is another question. We don't know any solution of, we don't know exactly how fast solution of this equation decay. At this point, if you want to go to a solution of this equation and look how fast they decay, you have to go to a stationary solution, as you will see in the moment. Okay, but then you have this kind of unique continuation. You have to. Okay, all these results are restricted to the interval zero t. That's not what we are going to talk today. We want to talk about the whole realigned in time, right? And then you can say, what is the strongest possible decay global in time that a solution of the Schrodinger equation with potential can have? And now we are talking about for all time. Hmm? Okay. Then you ask that question, you will get the following theorem. That is a kind of technical, but let's try to see if we can follow that. Suppose that you have a solution of the previous problem. Remember that you have a potential here, right? Suppose that you can write the potential in two pieces for the time being, suppose that the B2 is zero, and you ask for the potential B1 decay with this alpha. If alpha is zero, you are not asking for any decay. Suppose that you have a solution that takes values in L2, that is kind of weak. If globally the solution satisfies that is in this exponential weight, uniformly in time, with this P equal to this quantity, you have to be zero. Okay, let's try to understand this. You have two conditions of the potential. The potential can be split in two pieces. If you only care about the decay have to be this one. This part is have the derivatives, the radial derivative have kind of, a, you are said to have a stronger decay. If that is the case, then there exists a constant that depends on the dimension, the C1, that one, the C2, and the C3, and this alpha that is measured in DDK, such that if you satisfy this inequality, you have to be zero. Okay, let's see, let's try to keep two numbers in mind. If alpha is zero, what you are saying is that your potential is real and is bounded. Forget about B2 for the moment, right? 
And if alpha is zero, you are saying that if you decay against this power p, and this power p will be forcer in that case. If you are integrable with power against the exponential with power four thirds in the L2 with this lambda zero enough, large enough, you have to be zero. The other case is if alpha is one half plus, then you can take p to be one. It's not there, it's in the next theorem, but if alpha is exactly equal to one half, the p can be linear. Okay? And this is the theorem in the case that you decay a little bit more than one half, then you, if you decay linear, you have to be zero. Okay, let me say a few words about this result and what, how can you use this result to prove something else. And at the end, I will say that four-third is the right number. In some moment, four-third appeared natural. And for, at least for me, it didn't appear natural for a while. All right? Okay. Okay, there is a hypothesis on the theorem that says that this potential has to be real. And the only thing that you really need for this potential for the only moment that you use that the potential is real is because you want to say that your L2 nor is time independent or bounded below. This is the only moment that you use that. You can put this hypothesis. Is that the only moment that you use it? In no moment in the proof, you really need that the linear part is the Laplacian. You can write any operator of this form where it's not elliptic, and the theorem is exactly the same. The dispersion has not, nothing to do with ellipticity. It's the same theorem for this operator. And you can, if you are not into the business, there are plenty of examples when the dispersive model appears and the dispersive relation is not elliptic. Davis Tuerson, Ichimori, Sakharov, I mean, there's plenty. Okay. Then they say, why did four thirds appear? Look this, this result for 92 of Meshko. Now this is an elliptic result. There is no time, nothing. It's the, th the theorem is the following. Suppose that you have a solution of this equation. The potential is bounded, right? It's complex value that is not our case. If a solution of this stationary problem satisfies this, it's because it's zero. Then the fourth third is appeared quite before in an elliptic problem. Okay. And that, then you can add, is that sharp? Yes. Meshkov gave an example of a potential that takes complex value where fourth third is the best possible. The conjecture is that this fourth third, if this potential is real, should be one. But that is an open question, and it's, I think it's a very important and interesting open question. And the best way to, I think, to start working on that is not to read anything. Right? Otherwise, you will. Okay, let's see that our result in particular implies this one. If we start with this potential, we start with potential that is time independent, right? Suppose that our potential is time independent, it's complex valued, and we have. A solution of this stationary problem is a solution of this evolution problem, independent of t. If, or if you want, you take an eigenvalue problem of this source, where this is a complex potential and the eigenvalue is real, and then this is a solution of this equation. And this solution satisfies that the L2 nor is preserved, even that this is a complex potential since the structure of the equation gives you that the L2 nor is not changing because this eigenvalue here is real. Then you can apply the theorem and you recover exactly the fourth third, not for all A's, A sufficiently large. Okay. Okay. Then we have a then we have a different proof of mesh core result. And we recover and generalize another result of Cruz and Pedro, what is alpha equal to one half. Okay. Okay. Let me give you an application of this theorem. 
transcendent because okay, we we have to, like different application. The application can be what type of shape do you expect to have in traveling wave solution of these nonlinear equations? But we are not going to do that one. We are going to do an application that has to do with the concentration where the solution blows up of the Schrodinger equation. We will go there. But let me rephrase the theorem, re remind you that we are in a Schrodinger equation with potential. The potential decay more than one half. Then this is a, if you have a linear decay with this lambda sufficiently large, it's because you are zero. Okay. Then what do we know about this semilinear equation? Well, we know the local existence in the critical case. When you do the scaling argument, the critical sobolet tells you that is equal to, by the result of Kasenaf and Weiler, if SA is equal to this number, and you assume that SA is larger or equal to zero, and you have enough derivatives that you can perform this, then for every data that you have in this space, there exists a time that the pen of the shape of the form of the data, not the size, will be nice that the pen of the size, but it's not true. And there exists a unique solution that is in some class. And the math data solution is locally continuous. Right? Okay. Then in particular, for example, if you are in L2, if you want to be critical in L2, you need that this number to be zero. I mean, zero is accepted here. It's a an error there. Suppose that A is equal to N over 4. You have to do? N over 4. Then you have that L2 is critical. Suppose that you are in the focusing K. It's known that you have blow up solution. Right? Let's see what is. This is a what. If you apply the. So the conformal transformation that I believe is due to Ginevra and Bello, right? You have the following. If you have a solution of this problem, you can construct solution of new solution doing this transformation to this equation. In particular, if this number is zero, when a is equal to n, 4 over n, right? You will finish with the same equation. Then you pass from one solution to another. and then you have a way to construct solution with this rescaling in time and space. In particular, if you take a solution now of this elliptic problem and multiply by this exponential, you have a solution of the Schrodinger equation. And you rescale that in the way that the conformal transformation tell you. And you have that this solution blows up at t equal to 1. You have this, you solve the focusing equation, and you have that when t goes to 1, the h1 nor blows up, or you go to a delta in the distribution center, something like that. Okay? Then you can say, well, what is happening here is that all the mass is concentrating at the origin. The L2 nor is preserved, but it's, you have that. Then you can ask, what is the profile of this? function that is giving you the concentration. All this is, this is a constant that is blowing up, but this is half absolute value 1. How far, how far you decay when you solve this problem? Well, it's a result of Berestiki and Leon and Strauss that you decay linear exponential. If you solve this problem, your decay will be linear exponential, and this is the next one. Solution of that satisfy this. Then, now you know that this blows up is controlled by this function, and this, fun this function decay exponential. And everything is explicit because you have compute everything. But you have many other solutions that blows up, and it also concentrate, right? And they are not explicit form. Then you can ask the question, can I have a solution that blows up that concentrate faster than linear exponential? Then you have, I, we con you have a solution that blows up with this profile. This is the form, the solution of that. It decay this way. Then you ask the question, can I have a blow-up solution? All the blow-up solution have to have this form, or they can this concentrate faster than exponential. 
Well, the answer is the concentration profile, it cannot be faster than this. You cannot have a decay of this form, as the previous image, where this Q have a decay here that is arbitrarily large. This V2 cannot be arbitrarily large. In fact, you have these two things. You are asking whether or not you have a solution that can that blows up controlled by this form. You have to be rescaling in this way because you preserve the L2 nor, and you ask if you can have this shape. You can concentrate a little bit faster than linear when B3 is arbitrarily large. The answer is no. Or you, okay. you can ask the same thing for all. You don't have to be in the critical case of the L2. The critical case of the L2 is A equal to 4 over N. But if you take any A, right, you have a some S. This is the critical exponent that gives you for this nonlinearity, and you have to rescale this way. And you have that you cannot concentrate faster than linear exponential. then it will be nice to have a theorem of this form for the KDV equation, right? In the case where you blows up is known, right? but at this point, okay. Then the, the proof is very simple if we accept our previous theorem. You can, once that, Remember that once that you are out of the L2, you, of the H1, you have flexibility of which is this power, which is this dimension. You don't need to be focused. Or fo the focus is, by the way, you don't need to be elliptic. You have the same result if you put here any of this second order operator that is not necessarily elliptic. And you have the same result that you cannot concentrate. How do you prove that? Well, you use the, you use the conformal transformation and reduce, you pass the time interval from 0, 1 to 0, infinity. You have this rescaling, the time appear there, and now you have who is, your potential will be this one. Your solution is known, it's a linear problem. Then your potential is have exactly the bound that you need, and you apply the theorem straightforward if you the answer. Then you have that the concentration cannot be faster than linear exponential. Then you can, you, another possible application of this is what kind of shape a traveling way can have. And again, in this case, let me go back. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. You can ask which, can you have a traveling way for this time of equation that decay faster than exponential? The answer, again, if you apply the theorem, the answer will be no. And here you are not asking for this guy to be elliptic, okay? You have a, the same kind of result, and the pr proof is more or less the same. Okay, now let's try to see why the fourth third appear. Okay, That's just, it's, up to now everything is not clear, then I will try to make the fourth third clear. Okay, let's go to our theorem. If I knew how to do the year that put theorem and click there, I don't know how to do that one, right? Okay, this was the proof. Okay, what is the idea of the proof of the theorem? Remember that you have alpha is the decay of the potential and this is the power on the exponential. If you want to keep track, you can put alpha equal to zero here, and then p will be four third. Okay. That, that proof will be a little bit different, but what is exactly that, how you go in the proof? Well, you choose a function that is a strictly convex over compact set that grow exactly like r to the p, but it match the origin in a good way. You have to be a strictly convex. This function is no C4. You need four derivatives. And 
the function, for all practical purpose, the function is this one. But it's C4, of course. I mean, P doesn't have to be an integer and so forth. Then a convex function of this four exists, you can prove in many ways. Second, you say, well, what is this Haitian of this function of this four is this one, this is a radial function you have that way. And then when you apply the Haitian to the gradient of the function, you have exactly this power. Okay, we are doing all the cases, right? You're going to complain, what happens if you put p equal to one there? Right, I can see some faces. If you put p equal to one, the scene is not going to, you have to modify this, you have to put a log, and that's the reason why you need here this decay to be more than one half. This is, if the decay is more than one half, there is a modification of that, that it can be, is involved a log that will have all the property that you want. Okay, but we are doing this. Okay, now this is the, the function that is going to give you the weight in the exponential. And where is this going to appear? Well, you're going to consider this is the solution of your problem. You take the exponential and you want to know what is the f equation that f satisfies. f is the weighted function multiplied by the solution. And this is exactly what is your hypothesis. Your hypothesis is that this is in L2 globally. Right? What is the, f the equation that f satisfies? Let's satisfy this equation. You write it this way, and all the exponential disappear, then there is some derivatives in t, right? And since all this phi doesn't depend on t, then you have this. This s is a symmetric operator that does, is independent of t, and a is a skew symmetric operator. And you write it in this way because it's extremely convenient because you have these two property. This is S explicitly. This is A explicitly. And you have the commutator that is this one. And if you are in this business, the commutator has to give you exactly what you want. What do you mean that is exactly what you want? Well, look at this part. There is a minus here. Right? There is a, you're going to do integration by part. You're going to apply this operator to F and multiply by F conjugate. And when you integrate by part, this part is positive. You don't need to integrate by part. This part is, they have a minus here, a minus here. This is also positive. And this part is not positive, but decay much fast, faster than this one. Then you're going to be able to control this. Then for all practical purposes, the commutator between the symmetric part and the skew symmetric part here is positive. And where this is going to appear? Well, you're going to have an inequality of this source that say for any 2t that you have, you control the commutator plus s, the symmetric part, with the inhomogeneous part of the equation and these two expressions. This is very simple to prove. Right? This is a, I mean, like doing energy estimate. Okay. And now what is exactly? This part is going to be the inhomogeneous part. Remember that this, the derivatives in T with, of the F and minus S, this, the A part, was related with the linear part of the equation. There is a still a potential multiplied by your function that is going to be here. Then this part has to absorb this one. And now you still have problem here because you... Your hypothesis is that this term is in L2 and this term is in L2, but you don't know anything about this part. This is the second property, is this one. That if you multiply by an appropriate function, oh, this is a function that has support between an uh, interval of length one that is a strictly, it's go like this. I mean, I forgot to write that one. And you have this inequality. That gives you control of what happened with this part point-wise. Because this function is going to be bounded below. You still have the homogeneous part here and this part that you control. That means if you put these two things together, you are controlling this, the L2 of this part. And the only thing that you have to be careful is with this one. 
Suppose that we are not going to do the case when the, the, you ask for the radial, the negative part of the radial derivatives has some decay. Suppose that B2 is zero. Then we have for the previous proposition is that you control the L2 norm of the symmetric part applying to F in the L2 in a sequence of time that goes to infinity. Right? And I recall that F is equal to this one. This is what this proposition gives you. If you choose this wave function appropriately, that is exactly this one. This is the function. But you are evaluated in T. Then you have that you can control this part. And now you, you say, well, this is going to be finite. This is the next step to prove. This quantity is going to be finite. Why this quantity is going to be finite? Because for the previous part, everything, you have the, the commutator in this side, and you have the inhomogeneous part in this side. This is your inhomogeneous part. Remember that you are... This is the question that you, are, that you have. This is dt. Then when you do that part, the, the inhomogeneous part appears here. What is the inhomogeneous part? It's exactly the f. When you apply this, this is exactly the, when these two parts go here, this is exactly the f multiplied by the weighted function. You have it there. And now you want to absorb this part in this side. What is exactly the part of the commutator that you have here? Is this. This is what we did before. This is our hypothesis, is that phi is like x, I mean the radial, is a radial function that grows like to the power p. If this radial function grows to the power p, here you lose two powers, here you lose one power, here you lose another power, then you lose four power, but you start with the power p, then you have three p, and four power that you lose and you put in the denominator. This is the number that appears there. When you have that and x is larger than one, then you have exactly that you, you don't need to suffer with the other part of the commutator that was not positive because that decay much faster. And now you have, you see why the fourth third appear. Of course, right? Of course, I'm cheating. There is a lot of technicality because you, this is for p larger than one. You have to see that you cut it in the right way and, and so forth. Right? Then this is the commutator. This, give, this part is the part that gives you what you need. This part is the game faster and with this one is that you are going to absorb, you, with this part, you are going to absorb this one. Then what is this, the decay that you can ask in B is exactly that is controlled by this. And this is exactly the hypothesis that you have. And now, I'm sorry. Now you want to prove that this is zero and this is the proof. You say, well, this is the the integral of this quantity is exactly because you preserve the L2 norm is equal to this one, but you have proved that this quantity is finite. And this quantity, you can take it in L infinity. All this is finite for all t, and that is impossible. The only way that this is true is if you see. And then you get the proof, jumping all the technicality. Right. Okay. Then I think that... This is more or less the proof. The question that you can, uh, the question that stay open is, if you can do the better than the four over three in the elliptic case, when you have real potential, it remains open to see if you have a bet. What is really the decay of the Schrodinger equation in the in the semi-linear case? Because still, if you want to prove 
the strongest possible decay, you have to go to a stationary problem. And the question also is what type of potential you can extend this result, and if you can go this result to apply to solution of the KDB. Okay, thank you.